welcome back. Um, I'm Neil Quilliam. I'm an associate fellow at the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. And um, I'm delighted to moderate this session with Sabah Al Mutlaq, who is co founder and vice chair of Al Fanar Group. I've just returned from Saudi Arabia. I came back yesterday and had the pleasure of visiting Al Fanar Industrial City. Um, and I spent a good six hours okay. looking at the factories, meeting your colleagues really understanding you know, the operation and the size of the operation. So I've done a lot of preparation for this conversation. I'd like to um, sort of differentiate the conversation into three, three parts. First, I'd really like you maybe just to talk about Alphanar and tell us a little bit about its history, where it's come from, we all like a good story. I think humans and humanity is drawn together mm -hmm. from storytelling. Okay. So I'm going to ask you that. Then we'll have another chat I want to ask you a little bit after on philosophy. All right. I took some very good lessons, I think, from my yes. time there. Yes. And then finally, we'll talk primarily about the private sector. Yeah, all right. But be before we get yes. going, I think that for the students here in the room, I think the purpose of this session really is to learn and to draw from your experience. I think, that's, I think that would be a good takeaway for each and every one of them here because your, your experience, or well, Alphanar's growth, I think is, is very interesting and I think there's a lot to unpack. So maybe you could start, uh, Mr. Sabah, by telling us a little bit about the origins of Alphana and how it started. Thank you very much, Neil, for the nice words you told and about uh, the impression you got from your visit. Uh, but let me just start by expressing my happiness to be actually in such an impressive gathering and um, What's more important is not only a uh, business gathering, very impressive, the best uh, talents in the world, and, but also um, it is an academic atmosphere, which is, I think, maybe very much interesting for me to, to also will be understood when I explain what you asked me for about the journey of al -Fanab. Uh, back to the question, um, Alfanar is um, obviously we started in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this was uh, in the mid 70s, and um, that time Saudi Arabia uh, embarked on a huge, uh, a huge plan for. Uh, building the infrastructure of the country. I mean, now it's well known that for Saudi Arabia, nowadays got very impressive infrastructure. And this will bring us back to the 70s when the Saudi Arabia started building that. And we thought that we maybe uh, the best way to be part of this, um, I mean, the founders, the best way to be part of this um, of, of, of this uh, move is to be part of the grid. The grid was very primitive, uh, uh, something which is very primitive that time. It was disconnected, no grid for the country. I mean, I'm talking about electrical grid. Uh, so the start was, uh, and of course, the grid also will bring us to the energy, which, which is also was an ambition for us, the energy sector. Um, the start was a, in a very uh, basic way, uh, actually uh, just a retail shop for building materials. Two of, two of the founders were working in that space. 
And uh, from this, we started expanding. We started building our, our uh, uh, business, which mainly run around providing all kinds of services. Uh, that's including after-sales services, including uh, operation, maintenance, and uh, also the engineering. Um, in addition to that, we started on, a, on, a, on ob obviously, step by step, to build all the electrical materials, all the grid materials. Uh, and we started with the easiest one, the lower voltage, and um, we expanded from there. But uh, nowadays, I mean, after a few years, or, I mean, not a few years, I should say 20 years, uh, we, we, we were successful in uh, being uh, maybe one of the major suppliers for utilities in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, that includes, when I say utilities, includes power utilities, including water utilities, and uh, oil and gas. Uh, we supply uh, materials, which is, uh, we, we manufacture materials, uh, which is related to high voltage, low voltage, medium voltage, and all the aspects of the, of the, of the grid. Um, on maybe after 2010, we, we started to think about uh, actually sustainability. And sustainability was, a, was an important issue. It's, it's a very important issue for, for the world, obviously. And we thought that uh, it was a passion to start to, to to, to be part of this uh, very impressive goal for the world, actually. And um, well, that's when we started going global. Uh, we were after different acquisitions in different parts of the world, um, acquisitions which either target technology uh, or markets or uh, going to the sustainability projects in a more uh, mature uh, regulatory base in different countries. Nowadays, Alfanar is uh, present in possibly more than 20 countries, uh, different countries, and mainly in Europe and uh, uh, India and in the Middle East. Uh, that's, uh, that's the, uh, uh, however, on the other side, which was something which we are very proud of, that we are a Saudi company and um, from the Middle East, and we established uh, technology and R&D centers in different parts of the world. We have now four different technology centers, uh, two of them in Europe and one in India, and obviously one in our home market, Saudi Arabia. So this is briefly, I tried to just make it very quick and you know, That's great. not very elaborative. Thank you, yeah, thank you. I'll come back to some of the projects outside of the kingdom. Um, but I have, I have two sort of follow-up questions. When you started the company, I mean, did you have a, to use the word vision, did you have a vision or an idea of where you wanted to go and, and, and was it to grow as big and as fast as, as you have? And then the second question is, in, in putting the company together in the beginning, did you, have a, did you have an underlying philosophy? Was there, was there something that was driving you from another place? Yes. yes. Yeah, well, I, again, I would like to say that I am I'm, I'm privileged to be within the academia sector also specifically uh, in order to have a chance to talk about what are the drivers for business. Mm -hmm. How could you manage drivers which 
will ensure business prospect at the same time keep the balance with other values which are very important for the organization, for the society, and for the field you are in. Uh, I have to say, of course, being a private uh, company, like any other private business, uh, the, the growth is one of the uh, very important aspects of doing business. And for, for obvious reasons, I don't need to, to, to elaborate on that. Um, but on the other side, I mean, if growth would not be if the, how do you call it, the, your desire for growth would not be regulated by values within the, the company, within the or structure of the organization, you might endanger quite few things which will even limit the growth. Uh, in the sense, it might create the wrong culture with the company, within the company. You might, um, you might look, you might find yourself in a situation that um, y your, your capability of attracting the best possibility, the best possible human resources and talents will be affected. So we, I go back to our, our situation. Mm -hmm. We decided that, you know, uh, there should be a set of values which will not be, uh, uh, will not be optimized. We will we'll never uh, compromise on these uh, values. I mean, many of them are related, some of them are related to our relations with customer, which, which is the strive for quality, the strive for, um, for customer absolute let me call it absolute customer satisfaction. That's on one side, which is related to our relations with the customer. On the other side, when we, we were very much concerned about building the right culture within the company, which means that we are taking, I mean, we, we were going out of our way in many cases just to make sure that uh, our human resources are taken care of, and that everybody who works for FNR will feel that he's in the right place, he's happy, and he's proud of, of being part of this organization. Um, things which are related to social responsibilities mm -hmm. also make people proud to be part of, the, part of the organization. Social responsibility is very, very important. Keeping the minimum of at least the minimum of the drivers, the international drivers, like equality, inclusion, uh, uh, looking at the weaker part of, of any, any situation and giving extra care to this, to this point. So that's, that's something which we, which we wanted to, be, to, to, to have all over those years. Thank you. Um... I mean, often, I mean, it's, it's commonplace for a company to say, you know, we, we want to be inclusive, we want to promote equality, and this is, you know, this is, this is very much fits within a, within a PR campaign. Um, when I spent time at your industrial city, I mean, I think I saw examples of that, and something that, that struck me was, you know, the way in which I think you would probably tell me, I mean, I think you, you started with a, relatively small number of women working in the factories sometime. Yes. And, and now that number has, has yes. grown. Maybe you could just you know, tell the student body here a little bit about that growth and yes. how, how, that, how that's happened. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, well, this is, this is uh, I, can, I think this is an experience which is dear to the, uh, again, it's not only for the manager or for the, for the uh, Founders, it's also everybody in FNR feel proud of how, about what, what you what you have seen. This we started something like uh, possibly more than 20 years ago, and the idea was um, uh, there is a sector of the of the society um, which is not very attractive.
for employment, which is mainly being a female uh, and didn't have the chance, didn't have the, the, the either the chance or the means to, to go to a higher education. So I am talking about people who finish something with uh, equivalent to ninth grade or tenth grade. Right. So, so we thought that this is this is something this is some sector where we need to to address and try to give some specific help directed toward the sector. And we started employing females from this from the area around us, and we provided for them everything which will make it easy to come. I mean, they don't need car. We arrive. We arrange transport. We arrange, you know, meals. We arrange everything so that she can find the employment very easy. She will come and you know do her work and uh, uh, get a certain um, uh, get an income at the end of the of the month, which will make make herself, of course. This will give her uh, how do you call it a position within the family. Mm. That's that's. Uh, so that's what happened. And um, I think it was, it was a good experience. And, and we felt the impact of that. Not only, I mean, now, just for information, we reach from eight, maybe it was 20 years ago. Now we employ on this about 800, right. or, or, which is going to be even more. And during this period also, it's not only work. We provided them with training, basic training, um, education beyond what they, whatever they got in the school. And uh, you won't believe it, Neil, that we have, out of that, we benefited a lot by discovering talent, much of talent within this, within this, uh, within this sector. I mean, they were so thirsty to, 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 to learn few things to advance, and some of them, by the way, they are they reach managerial levels within the organization. Obviously, uh, they left the shop floor, so <laughs> that's uh, that's one of the things. So, uh, this is some experience we feel proud about it, and um, again, this enhanced the 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 presence of a solid culture within the company. 800, I mean, that's, that's a lot of buses mm. that you use every day. Um, I mean, every single woman is tra you know, transported. I think there are 12, 12 women in, in a bus and it picks them up from home and drops them. That's, that's a very big operation. Yeah, so that's good, <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's true. That's really something. Could you also, whilst we're just focusing on this, maybe just tell us a little bit about, you know, I, I mean, the land that the, the industrial city is, is, is built on. I mean, there was nothing, yes. there, was nothing there, yeah, was there before. Yeah, well, yes. That's true. I think you visited there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. I saw. Yeah. That. Well, this is one of the things which we we we, we thought that at a certain point of time, um, whether we in, in Saudi Arabia and many uh, different places in the Gulf, um, in the uh, Gulf region, I mean, industry and uh, entrepreneurs wait for the government to give them piece of land to to do their projects and uh, and this might mean waiting for maybe and delaying your projects for something like maybe many many years waiting for the government to to give you that um, in our case we thought that maybe we need to do something different we went into um, you know obviously with the help of financial uh, institutions but this was quite a big risk that time. Mm. Uh, we were not very big as we are. And then now um, uh, we build our own industrial area. That time it was maybe the biggest private owned industrial area, which was about 700,000 square meter, almost 8 million feet, uh, square feet. Uh, and we built all our industries now it is I mean, within a short period of time, we were capable of, uh, you know, producing um, maybe uh, or having producing uh, um, uh, manufacturing units more than 
14, 14 maybe if you visited some of them. Yes, yes. Uh, and this was also actually uh, another aspect of this, this, uh, this industrial area is that we, we utilize it uh, uh, to the last drop, as they say, at the COVID time when we, we decided that this is going to be a colony which is closed because we don't want to stop working. Mm -hmm. And we made it like, and we were able to protect ourselves against and our workers for something like maybe five or six months, which was good for us to continue uh, production until the, uh, the crisis a little bit, eased a little bit. Right, yes. I mean, I spoke to some of your, you know, your colleagues there who, who, who were very proud to say you know, they, they, lived, they lived on campus or lived in yes. the city for, for at least a three-month period. Everyone was just living and being part of the, part of the workforce continuously. So, yes, so people were living there, actually. Yes. Yeah, living there, and, uh, if, if including the managers. And if, if somebody will miss his family and would like to go out, that's okay, but he cannot come back. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I mean, you founded the business. You had this vision. You know, you, your commitment was, you know, this is private sector. You know, we are, we're we're going to buy our own land. We're, you know, we're going to build out. Um, and you've had this phenomenal growth. But I mean, your order books must be really full at the moment with all the work in the kingdom. I do want to talk about the other countries, but all that work going on that, you know, that, that we've seen in, in the presentations. I mean, are you operating at capacity now? Is there, you know, is there room for growth? Or, I mean, how do you manage that, that you know, continuous flow of orders coming from, you know, for your products, for, for your engineering, for your construction, for the infrastructure? Yes. Yes. You're talking about Saudi Arabia in general? or what? Saudi, yes. I mean, but al Fanar, I mean, it, how is it positioned to you know, deliver against? There's so much work in Saudi Arabia at the moment. Do you have yes, the, yes, the capacity? Yes. Well, I think uh, everybody in the, I don't need to elaborate on this, but everybody uh, from the audience maybe listened to what um, the ambassador, uh, His Royal Highness, the ambassador told about Saudi Arabia, and also, by the way, uh, the other parts of the Middle East. And, um, also from Neom, uh, this is very impressive. This is, and if you th take into consideration, it's not only Neom. It's, uh, it's at least maybe seven, eight other mega projects in Saudi Arabia uh, going at the same time everywhere. So uh, to name it, you find it Daraia, you find it uh, in uh, Asir, you, it's everywhere in the, the, in the holy places. Uh, and neon by itself is, 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 is another issue. I mean, this is, uh, this is something which... Uh, so the opportunity is, is ample in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we are busy, I mean, like many people in Saudi Arabia, but I think uh, for the audience, uh, Saudi Arabia is, is, is an excellent opportunity, represents an excellent opportunity now for developing projects, investment, and it's the right time also to do some investment. Many of those uh, uh, entities, they are opening now the, the door for investment, like mm. Mr. Nadmi mentioned now in his speech. Uh, it, is, it is an impressive uh, scene in Saudi Arabia mm. now. Mm. Uh, you have taken to take into consideration that uh, you have to be patient in order to know the, the, the local rules, in order to, to, to know that. But now, the, obviously, I think the commerce to Saudi Arabia now, they are very lucky because everything is getting easier, it's getting, uh, it's getting much simpler uh, to, to start the operation, including visas, by the way. Yes. Now, visas, you can get it electronically. And uh, so this, that's... Uh, as for us, we in Fanar now, uh, yes, you are right, we are very busy, but we'd like to balance uh, how busy we are on different sectors. We, uh, the sustainability is taking uh, a good part of our effort and investment. 
we think this is the this is the uh, the future and this is also not only the future this is also uh, some obligation for everybody to be part of that to be part of recreating the atmosphere the the background for uh, sustainable future for the humanity Thank you. I'm going to ask you in a moment about sustainability and your projects externally, but I just wanted to sort of say to the audience, um, uh, I mean, Amina asked, you know, um, asked, you know, is, 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 is Naom real? Um, the conclusion was it, it was or is real. But I think, you know, going into your factories and seeing the scale of work that, that's going on and the production and the manufacturing... Yes. I came just just came away. This is the real stuff. Yes, this is where the real <laughs> work is going on. We don't see that so much. Sat where we are and traveling around and looking at nice presentations. That was the yes. just seeing you know going into the factory, seeing men and women working and, and these yes. huge cables. It's just like mind blowing. Yes, um, we can't to, we can't afford it to stop even for one minute. So, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So so that yes, yes. that's that's the real part that we don't necessarily yes. see. It's the yes. it's the nitty gritty thing on the on the yes. day on the day to day yes. basis. Yes, you've mentioned the word you know sustainability a few times, and, and perhaps you could share 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 with us you know about the sustainability projects that you have outside the kingdom. Yes, particularly in terms of like you know solar. Yes. Um, and wind. I know. I know you're engaged yes. and involved. And again, maybe you could just refresh our memory. Why is sustainability is you know has been important to Alpha Nar for for, yes. for a long time? Yes. Well, actually, sustainability. I mean, it's a good part of it is power, and being in the power sector, of course. Um, I mean, this was the nearest to our. Uh, I mean, power sector is, is quite a good introduction to. To, to sustainability, uh, or the other way around, to, to introduce sustainability to the to the power sector. So we felt we are we are well positioned positioned to make some change, because being in the power sector, um, and we on the other side also, uh, Alfanar, I, this is one part of what we call it the values, but it, it is it is a business value that we. We would like to control our destiny. We would like to acquire technology, go deep in the. We don't seldom we go horizontal. We always go vertical, go deep in whatever we 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 are doing. Uh, so sustainability was a, a big issue for for technology and knowledge, and that's what, that's what we have done, starting maybe 2000. 13, 14, where we started to look for uh, areas where is a, a bit of mature set of regulations which will enable us to invest safely in the sustainability. Oh, let me put it like this, relatively safely. <laughs> um, and that's where we started. We started in... Uh, in India and mainly India, this, uh, this was our start in India and Spain, and obviously also in in the UK. In the UK, it took another direction where we were involved in um, in uh, producing sustainable aviation fuel uh, from waste, actually from municipality waste. Uh, we are very proud that uh, we are. Uh, one of the uh, first few players playing an important role now in the UK in, 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 in the future project for, for producing SAF. Um, and also I think it is, it, is, it, is, it is a project, you know, I mean, ourselves and other people who are developing the SAF now, I think they are coming at the right time, especially uh, after the mandate which was uh, dictated by the UK for themselves on for 2030. We wish such a mandate will come also to the Middle East which uh, might uh, bring quite a change to the, uh, to the sustainability scene. scene. I, I was going to ask that question actually because I know the UK is, is, is delighted that you, know, that, that you have this, you know, this operation here in, um, in the United Kingdom and um, 
would you be taking it back at some point to, to Saudi Arabia or elsewhere in the region? Yeah, well, yes, of course. I mean, we are working on that. Uh, I mean, okay, let me say not only Saudi Arabia, the Middle East in general. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is it's quite a, a market for that. You know that, for instance, um, I mean, sustainable aviation fuel is needed, I mean, uh, everywhere because, um, I mean, this, the, these airplanes, they're, they're coming and going everywhere. So yeah, yeah. you need to be part of the, it is, it is, it is maybe one of the few uh, products which is needed uh, across countries. Um, so, uh, yes, we are, we are currently involved in that. But however, uh, I have to say that we are looking forward that the, the, there will be enough regulations uh, in, try, I mean, put in place in the Middle East in general to allow for, uh, how do you call it, um, safe journey of investment in the field. That's, that's what... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you. C can I ask, really, as a private sector company, um, what, are, what, are some of the, what are some of the sort of the greater challenges that you face? I mean, either whether it's in the kingdom or whether that's in Spain or India. What, what, are, the, yeah, what are the big challenges that, that you face? Challenge? Yes as a private sector company? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the first challenges is the, obviously, geopolitics. <laughs> That's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for us in the business, this is something which we have no say about that. <laughs> right. and, but at the same time, it is, it could be crippling. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's the sad facts of life. Uh, yeah, but um, the, the, the other challenges, of course, the, you know, what's happening now, for instance, I think COVID uh, or post-COVID uh, changes, which everybody ha is hopeful that this is not going to uh, continue. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure that also it created some opportunities, especially in the energy sector for some yeah. people. Yeah. But I... I guess this is, this is on the long run, maybe it's not something which was going to be uh, advantageous, advantageous for, the, for our field. Um, here, I mean, in, in Europe, of course, always this is this change of attitude and governments, which might mean uh, sometimes you have to go back and start from the beginning. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. What about um, you know the workforce? Is there you know we've we've heard that you know there's there's this quest to bring talent into you know into the kingdom. Is that something that presents a challenge getting yes. getting talent into, yeah. into your industry? Well, this is I mean the kingdom. This is a challenge, but at the same time, I think it's an opportunity. Um, I mean, it's very, now with the huge projects, and I think we are briefed about uh, yeah. in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, there is quite a uh, pressure on on getting talent. Talent is, is not available. But at the same time, you look at Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia is is good part of the majority is, is, is very young population. So I think on the other side, uh, there is also, um, and we feel it now, is that there is also quite a responsibility on the private sector on the, on, the, on the people who are working, on the companies who are working in Saudi Arabia to, to, to provide new capacities, new training, uh, to speed up the process for training of those young people, this young generation. This could be part of the answer to the, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, to the lack of free technical technical resources, we have we started this ourselves since some time, and we have seen actually very good results out of this out of this. Obviously, you have to be patient. You cannot satisfy requirement immediately. Uh, things will get ripe after two years, but 
that's life. You have to be patient. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, would you would you say that you you know you take a a long term a long term view on you know on developing your your business and your business plans and um, I mean at the moment a lot of a lot of I mean I spend a lot of time in the kingdom and things have to be done very very quickly you know it's like give me this yeah. tomorrow. Um, but are you, you're, you're, yes. I get the impression you're, you're, you're more strategic or you're... Yeah, but we, we, by the way, we are very quick. I mean, right. we, we are very well known, and I mean, Fanar is very well known for, uh, for capability of, uh, of meeting very tough uh, time, timelines and demands. Uh, this is in Saudi Arabia now, it's getting uh, very common. Mm. I mean, uh, Saudi Arabia installed uh, 10 million smart meters in smart homes within a year, which is, you know, something maybe outside China. Never, nobody heard about that. Yeah. And yeah. if you remember that this year also was 2020. <laughs> so, which is yeah. the heat, <laughs> the peak of the COVID. So this is also, uh, this is, this is, this represents typical challenge sometimes in the project in Saudi Arabia. We are very proud that we are, we have done 50% of this 10 millions, uh, which is mainly the Eastern and Central area of Saudi Arabia. And that's by the way, it's not only smart meters, it's smart meters with state of the art uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, with the state of the art, also data processing and uh, reporting. So this was quite, uh, as I said, I mean, 2020 was, uh, even air freight was very difficult. <laughs> so, so yes, sometimes you need to be very quick, but at the same time, you have to balance. I mean, the best of things will come only with time, I mean. That's that's very well known. Right, right, right. I mean, you've 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 spoken, you know, several times about about values, um, and I think it's just from visiting. I think it's very clear that values seem to be, you know, an important part. Um, but were I a business student sat out there now, I might just think, well, actually, I want to, you know, the bottom line is mm. is my profit. Mm. Um, I need, you know, I need to serve my shareholders, or I I need to make as much money as possible. If you put values, you know, as a second or third priority, are you not compromising the ability of the business to, to maximize its profits? Well, <laughs> uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, sometimes sticking to your, uh, your, your values possibly could cost you a growth, some opportunity for growth. So if you put for yourself that certain specific sector you don't want to be in uh, because of ethical reasons, obviously you are going to lose this opportunity. Right. If, you spend, uh, if you spend a good sum of money on making sure that your values are being implemented, obviously this might one way or on the short term uh, influence your balance sheet. But I think at the end, this will pay. This will pay in, 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 in maybe in, in very surprising way at the end, also in financial terms. Also in financial terms, because this will create a trust, this will create uh, uh, employees who, are, who trust you, who, tr who trust that they are in the right place in the, with the right people. This will also uh, make your your customers value your word. So, I mean, you have to be at the end, uh, you know, don't look at the immediate thing, which is maybe, uh, okay, I lost this contract because I, it's, it's, it's not for me ethically, but this will pay at the end. This will pay. So it's a long term again. <laughs> it's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking about that about that long term. I mean, just just reflecting on that a little bit. I mean, could you, you know, could you tell us a little bit about, you, you know, in the industrial city, 
you know, the workforce, the, the numbers that, that you have working there. Yes. Um, because, I mean, it's, 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 it's an impressive number, I think. Yes, yes. We, just, yeah, we, we have... Uh, now, in the, within the industrial city, we have uh, something in the order of 4,500, something like that. Um, however, on the company level, uh, we have something like 22,000 right. on different parts of the world. And, uh, Different, but but within this complex, uh, there are people working directly. Four thousand five hundred. We have to cater for all of them, and uh, you know, for food and for uh, yes, yeah. yeah. And I noticed one one, one other thing um, is that you seem to have a Alpha Nar seems to have a tendency not to outsource all of its you know all of its services that it's bringing in house. <laughs> Um, yes. There seems to be a, maybe a philosophy that it's better to do things in-house. Is that, is that right? And why, why would that be the case? I think this, you have to look at it from the uh, concern about quality. Right. Okay. Right. The quality issue, because yeah. you know, we, we suffered from this outsourcing quite, and we think that this is an indication of your commitment to your, uh, to your employees, uh, to your customers also. So obviously either you have the, the very strict, or you will not only have, also being, being capable of imposing very strict regulations on your subcontractor, or otherwise do it yourself. Don't risk it. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a time when, when companies increasingly outsource. So, so you, in a way, you're, you're going against the model by bringing things in-house and, and, yeah. and, and producing. But I guess because you trust yourself, you trust your own yes. processes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. I'd just like to finish up with um, one, one thing for you, really, and that's, that's maybe if you could... Maybe if you could just share a little bit of wisdom from your, you know, from your experience. If you, if, if you wanted you know, the colleagues and the students in the room to take away one piece of information that they, they should take to their workplace or take when they leave here, what, what would that be? I'm putting you on the spot, but what would, what would that be? <laughs> well, okay. if I have to choose one. <laughs> just one. Yes. If I have to choose one, there are many things which is important, but if I have to choose one, I think, uh, I think is that don't give up. Never, never give up. I mean, I, maybe uh, I spend a few minutes telling the uh, rosy parts about, uh, you know, our journey and how it um, started in the 70s and uh, maybe 2000. 12, we were in 20 different countries. Now, this is the rosy part, but of course, within this, you have really tough times. So I think the, if you ask me to do only one, one advice is don't give up, never give up. You will fail, and you will fail many times, but don't, never give up. Always stand up and continue. That's a, that's, I mean, that's, that's a, great, a great point to finish on, and it echoes very much um, what the, the ambassador said earlier about learning, you know, we learn from failing and we, we, and, and we have to get up and there are, there are failures in life. It's not, yeah. it's not all rosy pictures. So I think, I think that's, 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 a great, that's a great note to, to um, finish on. So I'm just gonna draw this session to a close. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Um, you've been very candid with us. I, I, I would definitely, um, the ambassador sort of extended an invitation to everybody to, you know, to to go to Saudi Arabia, um, if you're able to <laughs> visit the industrial city, I would really recommend it because for me, this is where you see you know, that nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts of what's happening in the kingdom, in the region, but, but, yes. but in the kingdom. I, you know, it's very real, it's very tangible. And, and, and you know, I think, You've got to focus also on the local community that, that really you know, seemed to come through. You've you know, incorporated the local community. And I think you know, a lot of the time, people like me, we look at you know, Vision 2030 yes. and we meet a lot of our you know, Saudi counterparts you know, who, who come from, let's be honest, 
privileged backgrounds, yes. but the women in your factories don't have the same level of yeah. privilege. Yeah. And to me, that's the real transformation yeah. yes. that's exactly. taking place. Exactly. I mean, Saudi Arabia now is, is, is really an exciting. I mean, even for, for us, the Saudis, we find it extremely exciting time. I mean, it's, it's something which is maybe unprecedented, unparalleled at the same, uh, at least for this time. And also, uh, I mean, what's happening is sometimes <laughs> beyond the imagination. So, and I cannot describe it until, you know, maybe you, you need to be within this field, within, this, within the country and look how, how things are happening. Mm. Uh, how things are happening. And again, it's an excellent business opportunity to be part of a country which is in change. That's great. On that note, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.